name is Mike Franchini. I'm the Executive Director of the Capital District Transportation Committee, otherwise known as CETC. Often confused with CDTA, but we're not the same. Uh, so what I'd like to do is, before we get into 787, we're going to spend most of our time on, on our study on I-787. Just for a few minutes, give you a sense of what CDTC does and what we, you know, what we are. And just, just because we, you know, we're really not that well known, to be honest. So yeah, let me talk a little bit about CDC and then we'll turn it over to Sandy. So as I said, we're a capital district transportation committee. We are uh, okay. part of a, what's called an FBO process and I'll get more into exactly what that means. So CDC is a relatively small agency, but we are regional and we are public. We, all of our funding is federally funded, uh, federal funds. And the generic term for what, what, we're, what we are is called Metropolitan Planning Organization, MPO. Uh, we really talk about the future of transportation, so we do a lot of transportation planning, and we do transportation programming. And that program involves all the funding, federal funds, that come from the Surface Transportation Act, the Federal Surface Transportation Act. Right now it's called the FAST Act, but in the past it's always had an acronym. It's been ICE-T, it's been Safety Lou, it's been MAP-21. Uh, actually, their surface transportation laws date back to the early 1900s when they were called the Surface Transportation Act of that year. And then sometime in the 60s, Congress decided that every one of them had to have an acronym. So now we have an acronym instead. So we're under what's called FAST, the FAST Act, and that actually expires in 2020. We're, we're really, MPOs were uh, organized, established to provide local input. Uh, and the, before MPOs, state DOTs did all the transportation planning and programming for everybody in every state. So they created F MPOs in the Federal Highway Act of 1962. Every metropolitan area of it with more than 50,000 people is required to have an MPO. So we were established in 64, we have 21 members. Albany County is a member. All four counties are a member. So Saratoga is connected to the rest of the All the eight cities. You know, most people think of the, the four medium-sized cities in those counties, but there are four other smaller cities, like Rensselaer, Cahoes, Waterloo, and Mechanica. So all eight cities are members. Every regional transportation agency is a member of our committee. So you have the Thruway, DOT. Uh, you have CDTA, our transit agency. We also have the International <coughs> our, our Airport and the Port of Albany. So pretty much everybody involved in transportation is a member of our committee. Uh, there's a difference between the committee and what you see here. Sandy and I are part of the staff. So we support the committee, and the committee is the member. So we don't make all the decisions. We kind of bring our information to the, to the committee, and they're the ones that are actually making the decisions. We have two major committees, and this is really applies to every MPO across the country. So we have a policy board, which is made up of elected officials. They meet quarterly in our case. And then we have a planning committee, which is made up of engineers, planners, public works people. And they spend a lot more time working on the project and the plans and the programming. They meet monthly. So most of the work actually gets done in the planning committee. This is a map of the, other, of the 14 other MPOs in New York State. There are 14. Uh, in New York State, we're kind of unusual. We have one of the biggest MPOs. In, in the country, in New York City's NPO, which is by their acronym called NIMTIC, N-Y-N-T-C. So they're a very large uh, NPO. They deal with Westchester County. They had to approve the Tappan Z Bridge Project before it was actually federally funded. So that was a pretty important job for them. But that's one of the largest. We also have some of the smallest. Uh, when you look at Cornell and Mythica, they have a staff of two. Uh, when you look at Glens Falls, they have a staff of two. So some of the smallest and some of the largest in the 14. But as you, would, as you would expect, there's an MPO in Buffalo and Rochester and Syracuse and all the metropolitan areas. So what do we produce? For us, we really produce a couple different products. We have these, a program called Linkage Studies. We actually were awarded a national award for Linkage Studies. And, and I have to give my predecessor all the credit for those Linkage Studies. They were started back in the year 2000. But they are a way that we work directly with all the municipalities, all the 77 municipalities, in the four county region. And we actually actually fund these studies locally. So you know, the city of Albany has had many studies, the county of Albany, but even smaller cities and, and metropolitan areas, I'm sorry, <coughs> towns, like um, you know, the village of Westerlo, or in Burn. Burn had a study, a sidewalk study once. 
So a lot of great studies where we really get to work with on, on, the, on the very very local level. The UPWP is just our budget, really boring. You don't want to really even talk too much about that. But if you're really interested, that's where you can find out where we spend our money. The TIP is the five-year capital plan where most people are interested in because that's the funding. So for five years, uh, and we'll talk more about those projects, we put out a capital plan and all those projects are funded federally. When they when projects are awarded on that plan, they are funded 80% with federal money, 15% with state money, and 5% with local. So it's a pretty good deal. You know, you're going to get 95% of the funding for, for your project if you're awarded and you're placed on the tab. Long range plan is really important to the region. Uh, it's a 25 year plan where you know we really get into you know what what the region should be in the future. We look at forecasts and data to do that. The last thing on that list is just our travel demand model. The larger MPOs have to have to um, have a travel demand model, it's a computer model that actually forecasts traffic in our area. And we do this, we do it for DOT, we do it for our project, but it's it's really kind of a driver behavior forecast. You know, we can close roads and we can predict with our model where the people are going to go, where the cars are going to go. And it's been verified, it's been calibrated. We've had it for about 25 years or so. It's very accurate. Um, and we can actually forecast where cars are going. So the tip, just real quickly, uh, our tip process, it, we're gonna start this again pretty soon because we have to we have to update our tip every two or three years. But we send call letters to all 77 mun municipalities in the, seven, in the four county region. So we're looking for projects from everybody. So they all get this call letter, and they get a chance to submit candidate projects. When they do that, staff has to evaluate all those projects. We actually calculate a benefit-cost ratio. We fill out a, a long merit evaluation form. But we present this information to the committee, and the committee is the one actually programs the money. Uh, it's kind of tense. It's usually pretty, you know, we end up going to like meetings every two weeks instead of every month. But there's a lot of stress and strain because there's a lot of money involved. Usually about 60 to 70 million dollars a year in federal funding. So, um, planning committee reviews it, and the 60 secretary 63. And then, you know, the best, the biggest thing about TIP is that we try to remind people is that it has to, it has to reflect the goals in our long range plan. There has to be a connection between the five year capital plan and our long range plan. I didn't do that. So in our last tip update, this is just a quick table of how we funded new projects in our, in our last tip update. So you can see we spent a lot of money on bridge preservation projects, which are like repair projects. That's this line here is 30, $34 million in new projects for bridges. We spent, or we programmed, $37 million for beyond preservation, which are bridge replacements. Uh, and that you probably, if, if you if you listen to some of the information, the news, and the media about transportation, you'll you hear a lot about the fact that our bridges are in bad are in bad shape. So that reflects the fact that yes, our bridges are in pretty bad shape, and we do need a lot of money on this. That's what we spent a lot of our money. If you look at the bottom table, you see that everybody, pretty much every local government, or at least formal local government, received funding. The state definitely received most of the funding, but we went down as far as villages and award funding to some of the villages in the uh, village of uh, Boysville and Lovey County receive funding. So we really try to spread the money around around four counties and around all the different municipalities. These are the current Lovey County projects that are on our tip right now. Okay? So there's the name of the project, short description, the year that they were funded. We go by federal fiscal year because they released federal money. So federal fiscal year and the amount of funding. The first three projects uh, have pretty much been completed as far as I know. The last three are, are programmed, but they're programmed in the out years, what we call post-21. So there's no actual commitment to the funding yet, but they, but they do have standing as a project. So when we do our tip update, we'll see if those projects get moved into the five-year capital plan or not. But these are all the projects running there now. Albany County usually does pretty good when it comes to their tip process. <coughs> Long-range plan real quick, new visions. You know, we plan for the future. So we're looking at the transportation system. We're looking at the growth of the region economic development. We use it as a guide for all of our actions. It's required by law. And because everything is changing, the plan has to be updated. You know, there's a lot of things going on in transportation. Population, demographics, we work with all that. But there's also a lot of technology. And, and even, the, even the, 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 the actual traffic counts and the amount of congestion, all these things are changing on a regular basis. And we have to take into consideration. These are some of the topics in our new range, in our new visions plan. 
uh, we get into we have, we actually have separate chapters on each one of these topics. Uh, bicycle pedestrian t is, is, is a really important process for us. Uh, environment technology is where we start looking at you know the impact of connected and automated vehicles. You know that's the big the, the big thing in, in transportation planning is what's going to happen when we start really actually seeing connected and automated vehicles on the road and how they're going to impact safety. Uh, access for people who can't drive, all the things that automated vehicles are promised to do, will they do it? Uh, human services transport, a lot of people don't realize, but there is an industry out there where we do, and we fund some of the funding for it, where people are transported, you know, uh, elderly, seniors, low income, all being transported by this separate, you know, separate transportation system. We're involved in that. Operation safety, Sandy's our, our program manager for safety. You know, we look at crash rates. And we, we look at where we can where we can change that, what intersections, what roads are above average, and where we can actually make a difference. There. And freight has become a very big issue for us because freight's increasing. You know, we're becoming a, a, a you know we grow our consumer population, our consumer uh, economy, but it's gotten more and more. I mean, we want deliveries right to our houses now. So you know, now we have UPS and, and all these other vehicles on the road which we didn't have before. So freight is becoming a real important issue for us and for every region. When this is just a quick slide on, on what we do to revise all of our plans. I mean they have to be relevant, so if they're not revised, they're not going to be. But we on a regular basis we have to update our plans. So just a slide on that. How do we do it? This is really important to us. By regulation, public outreach and education is really important. And I think we pride ourselves in getting out to the public and trying to get input and out, you know, from our, from our residents. There's a lot of different ways we do that. We do it with you know, online surveys, we do it with public meetings, we go to neighborhood association meetings, we go pretty much anywhere we're asked to go, we will go to get input. It's never easy, everybody's really busy, we understand that, but it's really part of our job and our responsibility. Uh, we do it by, by committee action. So we don't make, the staff doesn't make the decisions, the committees are making decisions. We do it by consensus. Uh, that's important because one member is not going to get you know what they want and only what they want. It has to be a consensus of the full committee to, to pass to pass a motion. So consensus is really important. We, we spend a lot of time trying to build those consensus uh, issues uh, among our members. Just a few more notes and I'll be out of here. MPOs have no regulatory enforcement authority. We don't. I mean, some people, the public doesn't quite understand that. How do you function without regulatory authority? It, the, the committee can can actually can, can program money, but the committee has no way to force a member to do something. Okay, so it's not like we can go in and tell the county royalty that you have to do this without funding. You have to meet the federal requirements, but we don't have that kind of, that kind of enforcement program. We don't manage capital projects. Once we program the funding, it's up to the sponsor to manage the project. And DOT is responsible for overseeing that management and making sure that the federal requirements are met. We must have member support. I tell the staff this all the time, and we have to be credible, objective, and professional. But we don't get that support. Without the member support, we don't get we don't make any progress. It's really important to us. That's all I got. <laughs> uh, so, Sam, you want to turn this one off and bring on the that of, of what we looked at and the kinds of ideas that were being generated uh, through the study process. I am sorry. I am Sandy Miswitz. Um, I'm a senior planner with the Capital Transportation Committee. Um, so here are the uh, study area boundaries. Um, we looked at the corridor basically from the north end at Alternate Route 7 through to about the Port of Albany area, uh, the river, and then more or less the Pearl Street Broadway um, area with the, the eastern, uh, western boundary, I should say. Um, and the primary focus, obviously, uh, for us was on, on the roadway itself and the infrastructure. And I'll get into those details as we go along. Um, this timeline kind of walks you through from the beginning and initiation of this idea coming to us. Uh, back in 2010, uh, the city of Albany and NYSDOT came to CDTC and said, hey, you know, we've got these issues regarding long-term maintenance of this very expensive and extensive infrastructure out there. Um, the city owns pieces of the as access roads, the ramps. Um, they're also responsible for maintenance. DOT realized that they were about to have to do some investing to keep the system operational. Um, so they came to us and said, could we look at this a different way? Um, 
Along with that, we were reinforced by more than 20 community plans that said, hey, what are we going to do with 787? Um, it's been an issue, even going back to documents from the 1960s, that the land use side of the 787 big vision uh, actually never happened. They were actually supposed to deck over uh, 787 in downtown Albany. Uh, they ran out of funding at that time to complete that, that piece. Um, so the land use piece of 787 has always been uh, a challenge, um, but certainly that connectivity to the waterfront and those sorts of issues uh, have been in those community plans for quite some time. In addition, our new visions plan, the, the regional transportation plan that Mike spoke about, has uh, what we call the big ticket initiatives. And these would be very large scale transportation investments or transportation related investments uh, that are currently unfunded, uh, but would require further study because they are very large, uh, well beyond what we could finance through any of our traditional um, ongoing resources. Um, so in 2010, we, we reached the consensus to do this study. It took us a couple of years to get a grant from the federal government through what's called the Transportation Community and System Preservation Program. That program, unfortunately, no longer exists. But at that time, we were awarded funding. Um, we initiated the project in 2014 uh, with a consultant team led by CHA. And we went through a couple of years of the study process. Uh, there's a lot of technical work uh, that went on with this effort. As you can imagine, it's a very complex uh, environment. You have a lot of infrastructure, uh, data to pour through. Um, so it took us a long time to get to where we are now, which is uh, the draft report was out for review earlier this year. Uh, we had a public workshop back in June, um, and now, um, actually I think it was earlier than that, to be honest with you, um, and a uh, comment, pe comment period ended in um, about mid April, so I think the, the kind of scope the, uh, the workshop was back in March. Um, and we're finalizing the report now, based on public comment and feedback we, we've gotten from, from everybody. Um, this is a simple summary of what we we're trying to do in this study. Um, first of all, we needed to look at what's the remaining life of the, the infrastructure that's out there. Um, you know, what are the life cycle costs? How much does it cost to <coughs> rebuild or reconstruct or, or refurbish even some of the pavements and bridges that are out there? Uh, and what's, what's that look like? Um, we also wanted to look at how we could reduce those long-term maintenance costs over time. Are there pieces of infrastructure that could be repurposed for other things? Were there pieces of infrastructure that could be decommissioned? Look, took a look at all that. Um, in relation to all of that infrastructure work, we were looking at you know opportunities for you know adding to the economic development initiatives or waterfront redevelopment initiatives. There were a lot in all of those existing studies that we drew from. Um, so we continue to, to revive, refine those as we, as we look through, work through this process. And then the big thing, which is identifying the transportation strategies to improve that access to the waterfront um, and increase the community and environmental compatibility throughout the whole, the whole corridor. So as part of our initiative, um, we obviously undertook an extensive existing conditions review. We reviewed every one of those planning studies going all the way back to the 60s, um, remembering that we had four municipalities as part of the study team. Uh, City of Albany was a funding partner. Um, so each of those municipalities have their own plans that we had to pour through. Um, interestingly, they all kind of say the same thing with respect to this corridor, so there was some consistency there. Um, so we looked at it, you know, the infrastructure itself, we looked at all modes of travel, um, we looked at traffic volumes and travel patterns, we looked at the surrounding land uses from a high level, looked at zoning codes and, and sort of existing um, land uses, and we looked at environmental resources, and I put on the ground here just to clarify that this study did not get into the air quality issues, we looked more at the physical issues on the ground, so I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, over the course of the project's life, we had um, you know, an ongoing and extensive public involvement process, maintained a project website, we had a couple of larger public meetings, uh, we had an online survey, we had a text to send survey where you actually did a survey right from your cell phone, we had comments via email and cards and all kinds of methods were coming to us, we went to, to different meetings, we've been invited. Um, so we got a good cross-section of um, comments throughout the process and certainly during the last few months 
through that public comment period, which, as I said earlier, we're still going through the process of responding to. So when you've talked about it, you know, you've heard about these kind of highway to boulevard conversion type projects, right? That's really what I think most people are interested in learning more about. Um, this quarter is different than a lot of the, our peers out there. Um, here's some of the reasons why. This 787 quarter, particularly the piece north of I-90, is the third busiest road in the whole capital region. It's a very high traffic volume facility. Um, it also obviously serves multiple purposes. There's local travel, region, interstate travel, people traveling to maybe New York City and Vermont, for example. So there is a wide range of users and it's a very high volume road. We also have a unique situation of having a rail line down the middle of the corridor. Um, none of our peer examples out there have such a configuration. Uh, so that creates unique challenges. We're also right alongside a river uh, that also is tidal. Um, and is facing increased water levels with uh, climate change and sea level rise. So those are additional considerations. Um, 787 itself is part of our, our national freight network as well as CDTC's um, freight priority network for the capital region, which means you know there are certain uh, design uh, features that you need to think about in a corridor when you have a lot of truck traffic and obviously with the port nearby. Um, that, that's a, that's a, that's a consideration. Um, we have a wide variety of land uses all throughout this quarter in all of the quarter communities. It ranges from parks to residential to industrial to commercial. There's all kinds of different land uses and cultural sensitivity. Um, you know, we have a historical corridor from an archaeological point of view. We have a rich culture from a human being point of view. So those considerations also need to be taken into consideration. Um, through this through this effort, and uh, which, which makes it unique in comparison to some of the other uh, peers out there. Um, so I'll, I'm going to breeze through the study process and kind of skip that part in the interest of time. You can read all the details of what we looked at, but I'll, I'm going to walk through sort of the strategies that were identified broadly, um, and some of the issues that uh, and challenges that we still need to think about um, as we're moving forward. So the Main categories of recommended strategies are sort of organized in this manner, enhancing the bike and pet access to the waterfront, uh, managing travel demand. Obviously, with those traffic volumes as high as they are, in order to really think about doing something differently with 787, we need to work on how do we reduce the automobile traffic on that roadway. Um, looking at those, uh, whether you call it smart growth or other types of economic activity near the waterfront, how do we spur um, some development if lands can be freed up uh, based on repurposing of infrastructure or other initiatives. And then obviously, you know, looking at the transportation infrastructure itself and the different ways we could potentially rebuild it. Um, I'll say most of these concepts that you're going to hear about currently have no funding. There are a few projects that do have some funding and I'll talk about those as we, as we move along. So here are, is the first group on the bike and pet access. Um, this list kind of highlights sort of the five big ones that we identified as potentials. Uh, connections up in Manans between Broadway and Spiral Flats, connections um, in the warehouse district from the waterfront area, some of which are kind of already in motion. Um, the South Albany connectivity connection, so that relates to the South End um, connector, the waterfront <coughs> trail as well as providing um, access into the south end neighborhoods from that trail. Um, the images you see here illustrate uh, two of the two here in bold, the Water Street Road Diet um, in Albany, which is where they're actually filming the television show right now. Um, but we talked about that's a very wide roadway. Um, maybe there's some ways to reduce the cross section there, add in perhaps a cycle track or some other uh, you know, bicycling, uh, bicycle infrastructure <coughs> in the area. Um, and sort of make that a much more bike head friendly uh, environment given the amount of pavement that's out there uh, and what are relatively reasonable traffic volumes in terms of taking some of these uh, lanes away from other purposes. And in this picture, this is the uh, 23rd Street area up in Water Valite. Um, the city, as you know, already has a bike project uh, on Broadway. Uh, but you know, there's further opportunities to sort of narrow down 23rd Street a little bit, make it more bike and pet friendly and better organized, and kind of create that complete street uh, that we're talking about. And that's what a lot of these ideas are really 
getting at, and if you're not familiar with that term, Complete Streets is designing uh, roadways for all users um, at all times. Yeah, yes. Did you consider at all the uh, Livingston Avenue Bridge project that could connect Albany to Troy? Yeah, so one of the big comments we got from the public repeatedly was, what about the Livingston Avenue Bridge? So obviously this study didn't specifically explore that, um, but we at CDTC certainly support that initiative, and uh, through the comments, we're also reiterating that in this report, um, that you know, obviously we do support uh, the installation of a, of a bike path facility with any reconstruction of Livingston Avenue Bridge. Um, okay. Have you followed up on the funding of that bridge and what stage it's at? Uh, we have, and <coughs> I let Mike take that one. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of you know, a challenge. That's a, it's been a very difficult project, obviously, because of the funding and finding the funding for it. Because you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars to replace that bridge. Uh, right now, you know, DOT is still the project manager, along with Amtrak. Uh, mm -hmm. Funding has not been identified. The last time we checked, <coughs> Uh, they were doing some work on the bridge to uh, some really repair work on the electrical and on the uh, mechanical set, uh, systems. So when we talked to them about that, we asked, well, okay, well, how long is, how long do you expect those improvements to last? They're talking about in the 10 year range. So uh, that's about the best we could get when it comes to an update. There is information on a DOT website, but it's not, to be honest, it's not updated. Is it federal or state? Like, federal. The old bridge has a bike path on it, but Correct. it's not usable. Correct. It's, it's, you know, Sandy mentioned the fact that we support, you know, uh, a bike pedestrian facilities on, on the replacement bridge. It was really kind of interesting. We don't always get consensus very quickly or easily among our committee, but on that issue, the vote was very clear that when that bridge is replaced, we feel strongly, we, all, all the members of the four counties, feel strongly that there should be bike and, ped bike and pedestrian facilities on that bridge. So, I, and I think we've made some headway, actually, because, you know, it's kind of a transition. You know, some, some uh, in the beginning, DOT was kind of resistant to that idea, and certainly CSX and Amtrak because of liability issues. <coughs> I, think they, I think, to be honest, I think they see that that's got to be, that just has to be done. That, that just, that, that's going to be part of the merge. So, I think we've made some progress in that regard, but not on the funding. Yeah, yeah. great. Thank you. Any other questions? I noticed um, you had 23rd Street improvements, and my understanding is that they're actually going to move the Empire Trail to Alden Avenue. <coughs> yeah, um, so obviously the Empire Trail is moving forward quickly, and the timing of integrating that into into this project didn't really work out for us. Um, so, you know, it was one of those things that um, you know, maybe we would have had some other ideas come out of this had we known that was. The plan. Definitely a safer road. Yeah. And it was recently. The long term strategy for the Water of Elite section, which I didn't uh, touch upon here, um, we still include the idea of having a trail facility go on the water side of 787. Uh, the city's very interested in pursuing that longer really? term. Um, it's going to require some extensive engineering and some, yeah. some bigger dollars than just putting an on road facility in. but. Long term, you know, anything's possible. So, you know, we wanted to make sure that we supported that longer term initiative for the city as well. Um, I mentioned another pool of strategies is <coughs> managing the travel demand. So, you know, being a high volume facility with a lot of commute tra traffic during the work week, um, and also, you know, vacation travelers and others passing through the region on Friday nights and su Sundays, um, you know, what strategies could be employed to sort of deal with the demand side of travel. Um, you know, CETA is implementing a river corridor BRT project. Um, once that goes in, that's going to significantly enhance uh, transit service throughout that whole area, uh, which might spur some to make other choices when it comes to their uh, travel. Um, Parking and management policies, um, you know, there's a lot of parking, particularly in downtown Albany, up in the Nans, you have a lot of businesses that have recently moved in there, and you've got a lot of people driving in and out of there, but it's all free parking or seriously heavily subsidized parking. Are there other ways to better manage parking? Um, and implementing those bicycle and pedestrian master plans. Both Albany and Waterloo have adopted plans. Um, I believe Green Island has somewhat of a plan. Um, and Colony, I believe, is going to be starting a plan or is in the midst of starting a plan. So, you know, 
again, implementing those plans to offer as many transportation choices as we can uh, is one way we can kind of increase the opportunities and the options for what we can do with 787 in the long term. Albany also has a you know, plan to uh, have a skyway, you know, into the... Uh, I will get to that. Oh. <laughs> so it's ahead of me. So the next group of um, ideas is sort of these economic development ideas. Oh, what could nice. you do um, around the area That's of 787 nice. itself? Um, what if you could repurpose or take away some of the infrastructure that out there uh, is out there? What could you do with it? Um, these ideas largely came from existing planning studies. In this study, we did not go out and do a visioning exercise for land use in this corridor. So I want to make sure that that's very clear as you're reviewing the document. And we'll be refining the language in some draft report to reflect that comment that we had gotten from folks. Um, any ideas on the land use side are clearly going to need more public vetting um, and a lot more thought. Uh, moving through forward. Um, so the ideas that you see in the report already were in publicly vetted documents, uh, but there could be others because things have changed. Um, but the Albany Marina idea um, really was focusing on that south end area where there was a private uh, individual looking to you know, start a boat launch, and I think he's actually done that, um, and how could we build upon that area. Uh, the Inner Harbor idea was an idea that was uh, floated a while back um, in the city of Albany, kind of in that area where the warehouse district is now, to kind of bring the river back into the city by creating some kind of a marina. Um, you know, the, the visual for that was something like the Baltimore Inner Harbor. Um, so that was where that idea came from. And there's another idea for a South Waterfront Living History Museum to capitalize off of the Fort Orange history, sort of in that area maybe where the U-Haul building area is um, right now. Um, and then activating the spaces underneath 787 uh, was really not necessarily a new idea in this, but one that we certainly are, are heavily supporting because it's, it's the most uh, practical one to execute in the short term. Um, how can we improve the, the look and feel and the, and, and, and the usefulness of those spaces underneath 787? Um, the South End Trail will be one example of that, where part of the alignment of that trail is going to go underneath 787. So having that trail underneath there, you might be able to do some green infrastructure. You might be able to create some, some more attractive spaces so that the public has a better feeling of using the space. And it's not just dead space with weeds broken fences and DOT uh, maintenance uh, vehicles uh, hanging out. So, so those are kind of the land use strategies. And then on the revamping transportation infrastructure side, we, we looked at a number of approaches. Um, the first one, you know, what if we maintained it just as it is now? Um, and what would that mean? Um, as you know, there was some investment over the last five, six, seven years or so now. Uh, that the department made in bridges and pavements in the quarter amounted to roughly $120 million. Um, that has extended the life of all of the infrastructure um, beyond 2035. The point is that, that existing, the existing roads and bridges have a lot of life left in them. Um, so no matter what strategies we come up with with the main line, they're going to be slow to implement over time because there's a lot of existing life back um, left in the, in the existing infrastructure. Um, also, you will note that this pie chart represents the uh, bridges and their condition. Um, only one bridge right now requires full replacement, and that's one of the rail bridges. That's not even owned, it's not even a road bridge. So um, the bridges are in good shape overall. Um, so again, doing a major change to 787 in the next five years, 10 years is, is, is not likely to happen. There are other things, though, that you're going to hear about that can be done. Um, so interchanges. Um, we have a lot of very large interchanges in this corridor um, with a lot of ramps and a lot of movements uh, and a lot of uh, bridges, particularly here in downtown Albany, a large <coughs> interchange. Um, how can we, um, when opportunities allow, replace these with different types of designs. There are alternative designs out there now. Um, maybe we wouldn't have designed that stack the way it was or is now based on what we know today. Um, so that would be uh, one option. One of the challenges with redoing 
these is you have to deal with that vertical elevation difference, right? So the Dun Memorial Bridge is a certain height. Um, without reconfiguring the Dun Memorial Bridge, you still have to have some kind of way for the vehicles to not end up doing a dip or some other maneuver by changing the elevation of, of that um, interchange. So that would be a major des design challenge, but that's something that's impossible to work through. Um, there's a couple of other interchanges, so just in the interest of time, we'll go, go through all of them. Um, but the big one is, is this big ticket corridor initiative, uh, the boulevard. Uh, what, can, what can we do? Can we, can we boulevard it? What would be the issue? So we looked at that idea from the point of view of traffic, physical limitations or opportunities, the environmental, again, that on-ground environmental, not, not air quality, uh, jurisdictional, who owns what, who's responsible for what, uh, and the financial. So I'll walk you through kind of the findings of this uh, particular idea in a little more detail. So from a traffic point of view, this, this chart uh, begins down here at the Port of Albany and works your way north to alternate Route 7 on this end. Um, the green and purple lines in the solid color uh, represent the existing morning and afternoon uh, traffic volumes in the peak hour. So in the morning, the purple line is your peak traffic, and in the afternoon, the green line is your peak traffic. What these two dashed lines represent is what is the typical capacity of an expressway so a three-lane roadway like we have now in most of the corridor at 55 miles per hour versus a 45 mile per hour roadway, which we call an arterial. So those represent those traffic volume differences. And as you can see, even today, and this is that Manan section out by Route 378, we're already over capacity for an expressway on a typical day during the work week. So travel demand is high. However, when you look towards the city of Albany section, and you get more or less just to this, I'll call it the south side of Clinton Avenue's ramp, the volumes drop tremendously, well below an expressway volume, and shockingly even below the level of an arterial. So from a traffic point of view, in this very simple graphic, you can visually see that there's something going on in that section of 787, which from a traffic volume point of view, only looked at traffic volume presents an opportunity to explore a boulevard idea further. Um, so I will walk through. That's that's the good news story. So, <laughs> um, so what we did is we kind of envisioned, and this is a concept, obviously, certainly not a design. How could you even physically fit an arterial given the con the big constraint I mentioned earlier, which is the presence of that rail line? Well, as it happens. The area between the edge of the rail line, if this is downtown Albany on, on this side of the screen, the edge of that rail line and more or less the back end of the parking garages that line the corridor today can physically fit just from a pure measure. Um, six travel lanes, a median, some bike lanes, and even some sidewalks. Um, if you think about what's out there today, you already have three travel lanes in this section you also have two travel lanes related to those access roads that go behind to service some of those parking garages and some of the other side streets that come in and out of the city. And you also have some grassy medians um, as well as some pedestrian infrastructures back there. So there's more space back there than I think most people even realize. Um, but from a physical layout point of view, that would be fit. The trick is how do we get vehicles up and over that rail line on the northbound side, because obviously they would have to now travel on the opposite side of that rail line. Um, that's a big design wow. trick that we would have to have much more additional study on, um, but that's certainly one of the challenges. Um, what purpose does a rail line serve I mean, other than the transportation of crews or other? It's, uh, we believe that the, the last count was about eight trains a day mm -hmm. going in and out of the ports. Um, is it, is it just crude or is there other transportation going on? Or yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 In yeah. fact, crude is down right now. So those are the main trains. Say again? Crude, crude oil shipments are down right now. They, they've decreased from, from the peak a few years ago when they were having you know, to store them. 
store the, the rail cars right in the middle of the road itself. Uh, so there are fewer crude oil trains and a lot more other, other cargo. The, the northern, uh, say the, the rail line north of the port is owned by the uh, Canadian Pacific Railroad. Okay, so they access the port from the north through Mechanicville, uh, through Cahos, through Largely, everybody knows the line, goes all the way down into the port through the port of Logan. The other way to access the port is the southern end, the southern rail line, and that's owned by CSX. So you have these two competing railroads coming in from both from different directions into the port. CSX also uses the Livingston uh, Avenue Bridge. They use the Livingston Avenue Bridge, yes. They have, they have a use agreement with Amtrak, so they're supposed to use that bridge. Yeah. So you will also note, even if we could engineer this idea and all of the other things fall into place, how much land would that shift of moving those travel lanes to the west side of uh, the rail line actually free up? So we did a quick measurement. It's about 100 feet. Just for just comparison purposes, your football field is about 160 feet wide. That's, that's what we'd be gaining by shifting. So when you're thinking about economic development and land use, it doesn't free up a ton of land to do a lot with, particularly since this is park land, uh, which has a lot of restrictions on it uh, regarding commercial uses and, and things like that already. So a lot of challenges, but the opportunity is there um, because of that reduced traffic volume in that area. Some of the other considerations, um, the financial piece, um, this graphic, or not graphic, this, this slide, talks about the pavement in isolation. And if we maintain the, state, the pavement in a state of good repair um, over time, it's about $40 million. So it would just be simple overlays <coughs> to kind of do, uh, keep, the, keep the pavement in good shape. Um, if we were to fully reconstruct just the pavement, um, we estimated that that would cost about $200 million. Um, wow. The current state of the facility is kind of broken down here by segments. So between exit 23 at the throughway and the South Mall Expressway, which is the Dome Bridge area, the analysis showed that there's no maintenance needs for about 20 years. From the South Mall Expressway up to Route 378, there might be some minor maintenance, largely crack seals and minor repairs, but but they're basic infrastructure, this pavement is, is in pretty good shape. Uh, and similarly, uh, from 370 up, up to Route 7, there's no maintenance needs. Is that because of that $120 million that you referenced before? Partially. Um, some of this work was definitely, especially that exit 23 to the South right. Mall area, certainly Let's was see. impacted by that investment. Some of these other areas were in good shape anyway. The, the Region 1 uh, of DOT does have an ongoing maintenance approach to keeping uh, facilities in a state of good repairs while you're seeing constant small repavings here or there on some major roads like the interstates. Um, but that only goes so far too in the long, long run. Um, on the bridge side, as we said, we're, you know, based on the analysis, 35% of all the bridges in the quarter, and there are a lot of bridges in this quarter, as you could imagine, are what, in what we call a state of good repair. Um, and to maintain those in that state of good re repair, all the bridges, um, if we were to bring every bridge up to a state of good repair, it would, it's estimated to cost $290 million. Yes. Yeah, keep in mind, at least when we talk about bridges, we're talking about all the elevated ramps, too. Because yes. each of those elevated ramps is a bridge. So in the end, if you count them, there's about 57 bridges between the south, within the study area, yeah. from South Albany all the way up to North and you may, you may also know that this section of 787 right here, uh, here's the Dunn Memorial Bridge interchange, and here's the Albany uh, walkway over the, over the 787 quarter. This area is actually on structure. It looks like it's on the ground, but it's actually a bridge. It just looks like it's on the ground, because remember that was all built. It's all built. So there's a lot more infrastructure from a bridge point of view out there than I think most people even realize. Um, so as I was saying, it, to maintain all of those bridges to that state of good repair would cost us you know, $290 million. If we wanted to replace all of the bridges in this corridor in their existing condition, 
$690 million, which summed the mm -hmm. full replacement cost based on these estimates in 2015 dollars would be $890 million just to rebuild it as and is. And what period of time? Over the last 20-year period. It would take a 20-year period to rebuild all the bridges? Probably. Probably more. Probably more. Probably more. <coughs> Limited resources and, you know. Um, Not in our lifetime. It's, it's a long time. Um, skip over that lower section. It's not super critical to this conversation. The bridges, what? Probably the biggest problem with replacing bridges is maintaining traffic. Right. Developing the detours and maintaining some sort of traffic while the construction is going on. It would take, it, like, like Sandy said, it would take quite a while. I call it detouring the York. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. And then the physical challenges. We already talked a bit about that rail line um, and the service that it's uh, offering to Port of Albany and other clients. Um, the CP rail, um, the connectivity to other facilities, um, again, dealing with how if the interchanges relate to this neighboring facilities, um, bridges over water have their own constraints. Remembering that we have a navigational uh, Hudson River uh, that has certain Coast Guard requirements. So dropping or elevating bridges is not as simple as that sounds either with those uh, requirements. Um, and then by head access, if we did a boulevard, you have to remember that you're going to now be asking pedestrians and bicyclists to cross a very wide accurate intersection. Is that ideal? Um, right now, at least they're separated from that high volume of traffic uh, with the bridges that are there. But if you bring it down to grade level, they'll be crossing at grade. That's a serious concern about how that would be designed and it would be it would be something that we would have to take serious so look we at. We saw that problem in on seven eighty seven in Cohoes, yes. where they have that boulevard structure and they killed. Exactly. What if you have uh, walkways above it? You could at an expense. I mean, with every idea like that, it's yeah. it's just more money, you know, to put toward it. it and you know, again, we're not saying these are impossible. No. We're just trying to state the um, issues that would have to be considered <coughs> moving forward. On the bike trail extension, the county bike trail is a south trail, and we're going to extend it through the city. Do you have a path that they that we can find out where they're going? Uh, for the south end connection from the Albany yeah. Rail Trail to the Corning Preserve, yeah, um, that actually there's an RFP out right now for design services with the city. Um, but the conceptual alignment uh, basically will start from the trailhead at the Albany County Trail on um, Pearl, run along Pearl, uh, past the um, Edward Pre uh, Ezra Prentice homes in front of it, uh, through a uh, basically a cycle track is, is the concept. Um, then it would go underneath, uh, actually around, and use the uh, the ramp. The two service ramps. Yep, the ramp that is the existing in the port. Yep. Okay. Yep, and take a lane from that to create a uh, protected bike lane or a cycle track of some sort. Then when it hits the intersection at the signal, it will route underneath 787 at that point, okay. um, and then head towards the Corning Preserve area. So we do have, and I can send, share with you a link to the report that we did uh, with the C. Yeah, I'd like to see that. That, yep. that was one of our linkage studies that yep. we just completed. And before you even completed the study, the city was working on the design. So that was that, that's kind of one of our success stories. A lot of times you develop a plan, you don't have the funding, but they've already started working on the funding. So, <coughs> if you, you have put a bike trail in front of that apprentice, does that result in some traffic softening? Traffic calming, yeah. Um, that's yeah. why they're going to do a, a robust design process for that project. We know that there's some sensitivity with the residents there. Um, and there will be a public meeting as part of that project, so stay tuned um, as that project unfolds. We, we met with the residents many times during our study to develop that idea. And basically, you know, there was enough parking on one side of the road and parking near the, near the buildings themselves that most of the residents said they didn't need the parking on the east side. So that's where the cycle track would be. We would, we would not recommend that if the residents were, you know, happy with that or really satisfied or okay with it. Um, and then the, uh, the final challenge, or the, one of the final challenges anyway, is the environmental considerations. Um, and again, we're talking about the ground level, and in this case, the water. Um, you know, we've had flooding already um, in extreme events like the hurricanes we had a couple of years ago. Um, the sea level is rising. 
um, and we had a title, Hudson River. Um, so you drop that facility down to an accurate situation. Um, you're going to have more opportunities for flooding. You're certainly increasing that risk, the risk to the infrastructure over time. And any land uses that might be possible or could be implemented in areas freed up would be subject to a number of regulations and requirements from a number of different agencies. Um, particularly with respect to the fact that you know some of that parkland uh, currently you can't do commercial development. So there's a lot of challenges on that physical environmental side. Have you worked with any economic development authorities regarding if you did what if you did uh, make changes, what would be the ability to basically monetize that area? Uh, including like they do on the East River on FDR Drive, where they have Rockefeller University over, they have hospitals going over, and it essentially buries, in, in, by image, by perception, buries the uh, FDR Drive. But I was just wondering, I mean, those are economic development issues that you might want to, I don't know if you're working with anyone to give you those perceptions perspective yeah we for this study we did not go to that level of detail um, there was a previous initiative done that kind of got into that a little bit um, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head but let me put it this way they were not substantial um, largely because the amount of lands freed up and the constraints with these lands uh, outweigh the cost savings you would gain from the infrastructure changes so and also because we are not in a rapidly developing marketplace. Um, the longer term scenarios were a little murky that in that study that, that was looked at. Right, um, now if you revisit that, mm -hmm. I mean that would control basically which model would be best to increase that economic development mm -hmm. and monetize the road and increase the tax base. Um, in that Carter area, and that could spur more. You know, you build it and they will come, basically. You know, so if you make something that's attractive to be built over, then you can um, go out and the economic development folks can go out and pitch it. Right. Bear in mind that the this concept, if you're going to talk about decking like you did in Boston, now you're getting into a billion dollar. Project. Well, what about FDR Drive? Or we're we're talking the environmental piece now. We're not really okay. talking economic right. development. I don't want to get too far off subject. Well, right. I just didn't know if no, it, it, it's, it's a fair question. Come up and no, it's, it's, it's a fair question. You know, this this study just didn't quite get to that yeah. detail. Um, I don't know how it would turn out, uh, but something we can. I would keep recommend in that you would add that to your mm -hmm. study. Um, and then you know the final kind of constraint obviously is jurisdictional. There's a huge <coughs> process involved in deep, you would have to de-designate I-787 in order to execute a boulevard. Um, that is a lengthy, high level process that needs a lot of stakeholder support right from the governor's level up to the Federal Highway Administration and others. Um, it's a national level public review process because it's an interstate. It's not just the city of Albany's road, it's not just Albany County's road, it's everybody's road. So there is that huge effort that would need to be taken. Um, there's some state legislation that would need to be passed in order to execute something like this. And there's the very real possibility that we would have to reimburse the federal government for the construction of 787 as an interstate if we were to designate it. That's a little known fact that I don't think most folks are aware of. Um, that gets factored into the economic side of the discussion. So um, it's, it's a risk, obviously, um, but it's certainly another consideration That's to consider. Um, and I skipped over the NEPA. Obviously, something of this scale would require a lengthy uh, environmental review process following NEPA requirements. Um, and then there's just the reality of even if we can get through all of that, who owns it and who maintains it? Now the state DOT will likely say, well, this isn't our road anymore. Maybe this is the community's road. Maybe this is the county's road. Are you willing to take on the maintenance responsibilities for this? They're having that debate right now on that Skyway project. Um, that's currently a DOT maintained 
bridge. Is the city going to maintain it? Who's going to maintain it over time? So that's a, that's a big burden um, to consider and would need to be worked out in the process. Um, so where are we at now? Obviously, this is just the planning effort. We're not at an evil level of detail. This study really just tried to lay out for everyone the issues that would need to be further explored through additional processes. It does get into some, some ideas in terms of where do we go from here. Um, maybe we need to form a, a community committee with you know some of the major players like the state DOT, the county, the community municipalities to kind of touch base on these uh, scenarios. Um, and the status of the infrastructure so that we don't miss an opportunity again if there's a need for some kind of a major investment uh, from a maintenance point of view um, there's other ideas um, outlined in the report um, but you know we're a long way away from constructing something of that nature and it's going to need a lot more uh, thought and a lot more careful study but I didn't want to leave you with Okay, that's not going to happen. But let's talk about what is happening and the, and the great things that are happening. There's upwards of $15 million of investment committed to this corridor right now. Um, starting with the River Corridor BRT project that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we also have a smaller project in Green Island on Hudson Avenue, which is going to add some bike and pet improvements. We, great. Excellent. Um, <laughs> up in Waterloo, I mentioned earlier, there's the uh, on-road bike path and the cycle track that they're constructing along Broadway. Um, also, the um, Broadway to Mohawk Hudson multi-use path um, that they're they're working on. And I also wanted to just throw in there, and I mentioned it earlier. You know, the village of Manance has had over, according to the mayor, over 50 million dollars in investment there in the last three years. They are really growing from a commercial business point of view. So. There's opportunities there, perhaps, to build even more energy to your point about how you, you know, activate this area. It's already starting um, in, 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 in the village of Nance. Um, we also have a smaller project here in the city of Albany where they're trying to get a better um, and safer pedestrian crossing on the rail line near the port of Albany where the Church Street, Green Street, uh, Accurate rail line crossing is now. Um, that they're working through with DOT and with uh, the owner of the rail line um, on that design process. We talked about that South End Bikeway connection, uh, which is you know partially funded. They're doing design work this year. Um, as I said earlier, there will be public process on that, so so definitely keep an eye out for that. Um, and the Clinton Avenue Skyway, as you mentioned earlier, which uh, you know they're really looking to complete that design process for that initial $3 million plus project um, this, probably this month is last I, last I heard. Um, they're really working through a, a challenging path, you know, set of issues in a short time frame um, to get this initial, um, these initial funds spent on this new bike head access way um, over uh, by basically taking that, that ramp out of commission. And this again, for those that aren't aware, it's the ramp that heads northbound uh, from 787, loops around, mm -hmm. over and under, and then back down towards Clinton oh, Avenue. Okay. Uh, it's yeah. a very low volume ramp overall. There are some users and some concerns have been expressed about the detour that would be required. Because of the redundancy in the ramps and all of the infrastructure, the uh, Capitalize Albany project's mm -hmm. preliminary estimates is it might add a minute of travel time by taking the next exit. Next, next opportunity, and, and that's really the diversion that we're talking about. So all of those are some of the examples of some of those smaller but impactful projects that are going on um, in the whole corridor. There are more in, identified in the plan. I know there are more going on in the communities that weren't even noted. We talked about the Empire State Trail um, as one initiative, um, and there's more opportunities to think longer term about some of those big, the big ticket idea. Um, all of the information is available um, on the project website. Um, you can email me if you want uh, to offer any additional thoughts. Um, all of the reports, uh, which are still in draft form, and like, as I said, I'm still working through responding to all of the comments and finalizing these documents, but you can read all of the details. Uh, if you really want to read yeah. all the details, okay. um, they're there for you. And uh, if you have any other questions, 
Oh, it's not there? Yeah, just a quick comment. You know, really part of our job as planners is to come up with all these issues and constraints and put them in paper and document them so that in the future people don't have to do that all, you know, all over again and again and again. So, you know, we don't want to give you the impression that uh, we just came up with all the problems and just left it at that. We did look at these issues, we, and they are, they are, maybe feasible is not the right word, they are possible. You know, we did not look at burying 787. You know, we did not look at elevating 787. We didn't look at bypassing 787, having to go around the city of Waterville. So there are things that were just not reasonable to look at that I haven't mentioned before and said we just eliminated those altogether. So even though there are engineering challenges, environmental challenges, they can be overcome. I like to say to people, if you give an engineer enough money, he or she can overcome almost anything. You know, so it's not that they, you know, we, we put out all these problems and it, and it can't be resolved. They can be resolved. It's just a question of, you know, is there a champion? Is there initiative? Is there a consensus? Is there enough advocacy to get the funding? You know, people came to our last public meeting and they wanted, to, and they asked me a question. They said, well, what should we do next? I said, well, what you should do is, first of all, you should, you should be persistent. You should be patient, and you should continue to advocate for what you want to do. You know, because it's going to take a long time to change this this huge facility that you know took took years to build. And and you got and one other comment: you have to give the, the designers back in the '60s a lot of credit for what they built. I know some people may not want like concrete, but from an engineering standpoint, they did a pretty fantastic job in a really constrained area. Uh, without AutoCAD, with all the computer programs, all the you know, they put this on paper. And, and built a pretty safe facility. Uh, now, I, think I think we're fortunate they didn't get to build all they wanted. All they wanted, right, yeah. Andrew, exactly. Yeah. Um, but th what they did build, and this is part of the federal process, is you have to you have to forecast the amount of traffic you're going to have in 20 years, and you have to actually build for that forecast. Well, they kind of overbuilt it. I mean, you know it. I mean, I know what most people do. Drive these ramps or this road at night, you might be the only car on the road. You know. So it is a little bit overbuilt, it is over capacity. The idea is how can we reduce that capacity and, re and use the space that we can you know, re reclaim. So that's kind of where we are. Great. Any questions for Sandy and Mike? Doug? So based on the, like, the Skyway <coughs> piece that's being worked on now, can you help me? What impact would that have on the area of um, Clinton Avenue that's near the Palace Theater or the area on uh, Livingston Avenue near Henry Johnson. Is, was, does, does that interface with those areas in any way? Well, you know, it's, gonna, it's going to improve access for people in the Clinton Square area and anybody who can access the Clinton Square area of Albany. So the Palace in that area. Because you're going to be able to walk across Broadway and walk right onto the ramp There'll be no truck, there'll be no vehicles or, 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 or cars to compete with. You'll take that ramp, you'll walk all the way around, and it'll put you right back on the waterfront. So it'll definitely increase access from, from Clinton Square to the waterfront. Well, what about the area in Clinton Avenue going through Arbor Hill? Well, you're talking about, now you're talking about, you know, kind of a distance between 787 and the waterfront and Arbor Hill. Um, and that's a, I'm, that's not, sure, a, that's I'm not sure it could really it, it really improves much access for Arbor Hill. Yeah. It, it depends on what your definition of Arbor Hill is. If you're looking at Livingston Avenue and maybe Pearl Street in that area, you're probably a long way from Clinton Square. So the proposed Quick. projects. Uh, I'm sorry. No, go go. Okay. The proposed project um, addresses this ramp right here. Um, as it comes around, here's the Albany Pump Station. As it comes around. It would be uh, completely bike and pet oriented to this point. At this point, there's three travel lanes that come down to Broadway. Mm -hmm. The idea would be to close that sort of north side travel lane to motor vehicle traffic, keep the two other travel lanes open, um, so that now you only have two travel lanes coming to the intersection here for motor vehicles. So from an access point of view, it shouldn't change much of anything. There's less than 2,000 vehicles a day. For vehicles. Motor vehicles. For motor vehicles. <laughs> yeah. Um, less than 2,000 motor vehicles a day use that. Use ha, that right. Has there been any analysis of that 2,000 or less being the residents who live in those areas? There, I don't know, and I can't speak for capitalize in terms of whether they're doing an origin destination study. Um, 
we can only speak to what we have seen in the traffic volume data, which is most of the traffic that's using that bridge is in the morning, which indicates they're state employees or other office workers, but they're not residents of the city. We did we did model it on our computer travel on the travel man model, and the detour is to continue on the service road to the Colony Street exit, and then basically make a left hand turn on Water Street and come back to Clinton Avenue. So it's a one minute detour that you know those two thousand cars should have no problem handling. This point. that's that that's the theory. Okay. Now they're still being worked on. Yeah. The other yeah. issue here, if you notice, that ramp is actually State Route Nine. Mm -hmm. Surprised the heck out of me. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't know that. But State Route Nine North, you actually get off on that ramp. You take the ramp and you go up Clinton Avenue. Now, when I saw that, I said, you know, hopefully, and I'm not there yet. They reroute Route Nine because I don't understand why Route Nine should go up Clinton Avenue. I mean, that's directing trucks up Clinton Avenue, a really busy area with yeah. a lot of residents. They they could find other ways for trucks to continue on Route Nine besides Clinton Avenue. Yeah. But what I'm curious about, while you have fewer than 2,000 vehicles uh, on that bridge, mm -hmm. um, when they go to Water Street and then they backtrack, is uh, is the capacity there to handle that on Water Street? That that doesn't seem to be yeah. as though there's enough capacity. It looks like you've got to build out and and modernize the structure, the street structure of that uh, yeah. of Water Street. Again, the engineering is just being done right now. I mean, they'll have to do some signage changes to make sure people understand. Yeah. But from what we can see right now, there's definitely capacity to handle 2,000 cars a day. Definitely. And 2,000 cars a day is spread over a 25 hour period. That's a lot of cars. That's not a lot of cars. That's not a lot of cars. But no, when you're talking about 80,000 cars on, on 787 itself, <coughs> the ramps, most of the ramps are, you know, even even the closest ramps, I think, are around five to 8,000. The other ramps, so yeah. 2,000 is really, really small compared to the other ramps. Right, but wouldn't there need to be reconstruction of that, of Colony Street to Water Street and over to Clinton? Again, I'm not an engineer, and that's being done now. Is there someone who so, is an engineer? No, I mean, it's being, the, yeah. well, they, 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 hired, they hired a consultant to do it right, right. now. So that's being done to the Catalyze Albany's yeah, project right, right now, so they have an engineering firm looking at that issue. So they'll, they'll definitely look at things like that. They're going to have to sign the plans, they're going to have to sign the, plans, have to sign the details. So. Because you seem to think that there is enough. From our travel to them, model, yes. Um, <coughs> Question: We haven't touched on that. We've got another can of worms here at the, uh, you know, the I-90 bridge that uh, goes over uh, the Hudson River, and, and we got space underneath there. Yeah, keep on going up. Yeah, keep, keep, keep on going. Keep on going. I call it a can of worms because of the yeah, bridge. Yeah, the DLT calls it a stack that because it's like got you know, it's so a big stack. Of Oh, pretty. Huh? Come on, it's a flower. <laughs> <laughs> underneath those, there's room. Have you looked at that? The room underneath, too, because you want to know what the kumbaya kind of person. Um, double check. Probably not, because probably not. because there you really do have the traffic and the need for all those ramps for most of those ramps. I think the you only know, we start seeing ramps that aren't used is when we get up there in the field around loud and low. Okay. Those ramps there. I'm just concerned about the room underneath that you have that's not being utilized. Yeah, I think I think in that case because it's I-90 and 787, it's being utilized. Yeah. So. Oh, it's just taking them away. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, but I don't want any other way to do that. You know, to get the cars in. Yeah, we did not specifically look at that one largely because the state just reconstructed that whole. Thing. Yeah, they just so yeah. the strategy that would likely apply would be that island activating island. that space underneath. Maybe there's some trails, maybe there's some connections that can be made, <coughs> maybe there's some other ways. That would definitely require some additional study. Okay. Well, Any other questions for Sandy and Mike? Mark? No, for the um the the rerouting of the truck from the um south end from the Ezra Prince area, how does that impact some of the projects that are about to be implemented now. Okay, well that was, that was kind of a separate project that we took on. We funded the study with the city of Albany <coughs> to Ezra Prentice and South Pearl Street and all the heavy vehicles that were on the, using that road. Uh, we offered uh, about 22 different detours to vehicles that could 
you know, still get to where they're going, north and south, mm -hmm. and still not pass, you know, as apprentice homes. We did a uh, kind of no and these are origins and destination study, so we know where the trucks, heavy vehicles were going and where they were coming. So we offered them, you know, several different um, alternative routes and detours. Um, we offered them a couple <coughs> other strategies. One strategy was to visit, you know, to actually enter into dis into discussions with all the truck generators in that area. Because it is a commercial area. South as as Prentice, you've got Clemente Latham, you've got the, uh, the county waste recovery facility, you've got the bus people that are still there. So it, there's a lot of commercial development down south. So talk to those people and see what they can do without any kind of mandatory, you know, lane changes or signage and see if they can reroute uh, the trucks themselves. I think that's one of the strategies that we started, we recommended first, and then to go kind of further down the line. I don't have a summary of the study, but it's on our, it's on our website if you're more interested. So in other words, they, they haven't made a decision about exactly how it's going to be rerouted, but you have gave them a number of options that are presently being considered? Yeah, and I know that the mayor has met with several large truck <coughs> generators and, you know, tried to convince them all, you know, to do just like that, to make sure that their drivers know there are other ways to do this and try to avoid as apprentice. We're going to... DOT, New York State DOT, was very helpful in that study, but they have a traffic counter right in front of Ezra Prentice. Yeah, so there was a GPS that was going to make sure that 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 area was going to be rerouted away from that hev heavy truck traffic. Well, what we're going to do is in September, we're going to go back to those counters, and we're going to see if the voluntary, let's call it the voluntary uh, avoidance of Ezra Prentice uh, and that road, see if that's working. So in other words, see if the heavy vehicles have actually decreased from the last time we counted them last year to September this year. And then we'll get back to the mayor and people involved at Ezra. We may, we may meet with Ezra Prentice on the residents again. I don't know. Don't, 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 don't. We have the information we want. But anything else, folks? All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.